Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. <laughs> that picture sure is something, isn't it? <laughs> it's so bad. I wish everybody that was listening to this could see just this picture. That's, it's like a character drawing of... Somebody named Blake. Oh, we'll, <laughs> it's their we'll, banter about podcasts. We'll post it. We'll, po- <laughs> we'll post it. This has to go in Slack, on Twitter, everywhere. Oh, my God. People it's, that don't actually know what I look like, they'll be like, oh, my goodness. Is this really him? Absolutely beautiful. You couldn't even hold it until after the intro. But <laughs> <laughs> Hi, guys. We're back. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. It's episode 120. Uh, it's February 11th, 2019. Um, if you're watching us, hello. We have the picture right here for you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Jeff will have nicely sliced that one in for us. <laughs> oh my goodness, it's awful. Oh. No, it's not. It's it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's it's a beautiful Monday here after a long weekend of raining. Uh, we got some stories to talk about today. Amazon is going to try to regulate itself over facial recognition software before Congress does. Uh, we're going to also be talking about how IMAX ditched VR, uh, but big theaters are buying in. We're going to talk about how the Army thinks their new rifle will be like an iPhone and talk about some disturbing results with the TSA finding an average of 11 guns a day in carry-on bags last year. But first, uh, we got some programming notes here. Hey, go like and subscribe on YouTube. We need just a few more of you to get that, uh, to get that slash name. Uh, that's that's big for us because that helps with discoverability of the show. Uh, it really helps with uh, the word of mouth. I think we're at 73 right now if you're checking. Uh, I was. I could be totally wrong. Anyway, yeah, we need a few more of you. Uh, that'd be great if you could just take a minute of your time. If you don't want to take some time to like review the show or anything, that's just one way you can help us to just give us a just give us a quick sub. Um, anyway, hey, uh, we have the HFES Healthcare Symposium giveaway we started last week remember we are giving away admission to the healthcare symposium that's super exciting um, yeah it absolutely is it doesn't look like you or i blake will be able to go maybe you will maybe 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 we're, we're still it's pre- up in the air but it looks like neither one of us will be able to go but however we've got plans we do have plans for coverage so uh be on the lookout uh fan favorite elise will be back on the show i know a lot of you really like elise's commentary uh she will be back on the show hopefully she will be able to go i think we're still working out some of the details there um which would be way more benefit really than you or i because she's very very interested in human factors and in healthcare. and we're going to pass that benefit back to our listeners because exactly. i feel like she could very much like take that and run with it whereas we'd be like uh yeah what's this very basic healthcare thing that you talked about wait how does this work <laughs> exactly yeah, it'd be really it'd be it'll be a great time so hopefully we'll get just as much coverage and some more interviews out of healthcare symposium but yeah for now just a little giveaway. Yeah. So in order to enter this giveaway, we told you guys last week on the show, there's a link in the show notes. We posted it on our Twitter and our Slack. Uh, there's a link there to Rafflecopter. Go there. Uh, you can tweet at us, follow us, follow HFES. Uh, give us a review for entries. Please go do that. Uh, you know, I think it's a really great opportunity. Even if you're, you know, kind of semi-interested, you don't have to be a member to enter. Just go and enter. And we've got a link in the show notes for this, right, too? Yeah, we do. In case, and the description yep. on YouTube. Link in the show notes, description on YouTube. Uh, it's a great place for you to get insights, you know, on the latest science and best practices in the field of healthcare human factors. And like you mentioned last week, it's not just, it's not only that, human factors practitioners there, it's like everybody in the healthcare domain. Um, so you kind of get like this wide swath of of uh, various professions there. Which is so interesting to have at a conference because it, it really contrasts very well with the annual conference that we had, have every year of HFES where we can get together with like practitioners that know the field very well and all that kind of stuff. But it's it's really nice to be in like an applied area like healthcare and see perspectives from doctors, people in the FDA, people that work in the military, people that are actually out in commercial systems like Abbott and stuff like that. And Nick's about to die laughing. I, at I am something. because, well, because I'm scrolling down in the notes and I see the picture yep, again. It shouldn't be there. <laughs> but yeah. Okay. So yeah. the moral of the story, go, if you can go to the healthcare symposium, we'd love for you to be able to get your admission waived by entering our giveaway. Absolutely. And uh, you can meet up with Elise and, and uh, talk human factors with uh, our field correspondent from the show. There you go. Um, I think also, just to let everybody know, I think we're trying to organize potentially like a roundtable of uh, 
you know, a couple folks to, to kind of talk about their experience. So we still will have coverage. I just don't think we'll be able to physically be there. We'll still cover the thing. Uh, so you can look forward to that next month. When Air is spirit. that? That's like March yeah. something, right? I, I feel like the, almost March, the end of March, about the 20... 24th through the 27th. There we go. There we go. So enter now. Enter now. So that way you have a chance to win. Okay, Blake. It's time for that part of the show where we usually talk about two different things, but I think this time we're going to talk about the same thing. Is that right? Well, I think this part of the show is called Blake's Banner about podcasts. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay, let's get that picture out of there. Oh, you my do, goodness. It's to too much. All right. But yeah, so Nick and I embarked on an all-night Friday night adventure across the internet. Across the internet, uh, and really... Uh, it, it was a, a, a an experience that we haven't really done before. We've hung out outside of work. Um, we have, you know, hung out before, but I don't think we've ever actually played video games together. This is a, which is so silly because I literally really, bought a PlayStation so that we could. Right, and that was like a year or so ago. At least it's yeah. more than a year now. It's probably two years coming on. So anyway, we we kind of we did it for the first time. We played together, and it was pretty great. It was hilarious. So we played this game called Apex Legends. It's just This just came out last week, and the way they released it was kind of interesting where they didn't have any promotional materials uh, up until the day that the thing released. Um, Which is so interesting. They dropped it. it. And I think we've talked about this on the show before where, like, programs or, or – programs oh, it's not programs uh uh video games like fortnite i could never get into i love the kind of battle royale concept and if you're unfamiliar it's basically like you put um a lot of players on one map and over time the map becomes smaller and smaller forcing you into a singular space in which you have to defeat your enemies um and i've always kind of liked this concept but could never get into it for one reason or or another uh PUBG didn't stick with me fortnite just i I didn't like it, and I think we've talked about this on the show how I how I didn't like Fortnite, and then uh, but you really liked Fortnite, yeah. But it was one of those things where I had to kind of get myself into it, to be completely honest. And I've never I sometimes I don't even enjoy playing it that much because it's in third person, and that's kind of like out of my wheelhouse when it comes to video games. As silly as that sounds, I'm like right. I'm much more into the first person shooter thing, which Apex is why Legends. Apex Legends is so awesome, and I'm glad you introduced me to it. Right, and so they're they're made by a company that you've actually played other games of theirs and and felt very familiar with. Uh, so this was easy for you to jump into. is easy sell for you. Um, and it's something that I find myself actually really invested in. Like, this is this is the first Battle Royale, which is that game mode that I described, game that I've actually felt really compelled to play. And I don't know if it's because I'm playing with you or if it's the content of the game. I've played a couple matches without you, so I'm imagining it's the game. But let's talk about the game because there's a couple things, at least that I picked up on, that make this thing different from anything else. And one of them that I'll talk about right off the top is inventory management. And I think they employ some UX or human factors pra uh, practices that are readily apparent, right? So are you talking like in-game inventory management? Yes. Okay. So, yeah. so you're in the game mode and, uh, you know, some of the, some of the, I guess, uh, secondary goals of these game modes is to go around and collect better armor, better weapons, upgrade your weapons and your armor so just simply put um i think inventory management and item like discoverability is really well done in this game where you can always tell if there's something better than what you have on the ground um and it's also got that kind of smart system to it that doesn't ever, ever let you really like screw that up like if, right. if you see something like laying on the ground like say it's a piece of armor and it's better than whatever you have great it'll like it'll let you pick it up but otherwise it kind of gives you this like warning noise like eh, you don't really want that right um, so that's pretty it's a pretty interesting kind of setup in that case right yeah so they do a really good job of that and uh yeah it just auto equips everything you don't have to spend any time futzing around in the inventory screen like you do on other games where you have to like attach this modification to this gun it just happens um and because of that it just it all kind of works and i really appreciate that um, I don't know. That's that's the first thing that kind of hit me about this game. What about you? So for me, like when I've been playing Fortnite, because I don't, I don't actually have many friends that play on PlayStation or even play on Xbox One anymore. So it was mainly me jumping in and doing like solo stuff. Which Call of Duty, that's the same thing. It puts you into different game modes where you're, you have like random human players or whatever, random teammates. But I really like the fact that it forces you to play in a small team because it's it 
just starts starts you off like you're all kind of on the same level playing field because it's a new game, uh, and you have to work together or else you can't really achieve the end goal. And the nice thing, and we've talked about this a little bit in game, is even with people that don't have a mic, and I this is where I think they're the franchise will be really successful is you don't have to have a mic to communicate with people within the game. You can tag things on the screen by oh, yeah. whether it's enemies, locations, gear, anything. And so you can operate without even having to talk to people. And you and I had an interesting conversation where it was like the difference between one of us likes to talk in game. And one of us just doesn't really like to talk right. in game. So but I can still like, communicate with others. Right. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. So for me, it, it's going to sound weird as the host of a podcast i have this weird social anxiety when i when i play video games it's like i don't want to talk to random strangers on games i'm fine like blasting my voice out to a million people because they can't talk back i don't know <laughs> but here's the thing is like i don't like doing that but there's like blake said there's this way to communicate in the game which is actually really well done as well i'd like to commend them on this too so there's uh, I, th- I think it's r1 uh, which, if you're unfamiliar, it's on, on the video game controllers. It's like the the kind of you tap it with your index finger. It's on the top right of the controller. And what this does is it kind of alerts your group, right? Let's say I'm playing with Blake and somebody else, Mateo from our Slack. Uh, which, quick note, if you're listening to this and want to play with us, let us know on Slack. We're happy to invite you to our third. Yes, we're definitely third. missing a third. Yeah. It's, uh, it, we could use one <laughs> for sure. For sure. So, yeah, just let us know if this is something you're into. Um, so, like, let's say, let's say I'm playing with my group and I want to alert them that, hey, I see an enemy over there. All I have to do is look at the enemy and the game is smart enough to know, oh, hey, there's an enemy over there. I'm going to call that out. Whereas if it wasn't on an enemy, it would just say, hey, let's move to this location. And if it was on, a, on an item, it would actually call out that item and say, hey, there's a set of armor over here uh, and give you actually amplifying details like level one, level two uh, that indicate whether or not it's better than what you have. So there's a lot of really interesting um, communication that's done just based on the context of where you're looking and i think that's it's really well done it's pretty stellar and then then just like the class structure they've gone with it's really cool because it's got a variation of like whether you want to attack stuff heal things or basically be a shield for somebody else right and it's got it's a nice blend for a lot of different like playing options so it's it's really really cool and they start you off with a fair amount of the characters unlocked so there's a lot of like different playability options that you can like sift through yeah it's I don't know. Like, I, I hope we're not boring anybody who's like not super into video games, but I, I just think there's so many well done things in terms of the UI in this that I, I don't want to gloss over. And one thing that I found, and this is personally kind of astonishing for me because with Fortnite, I kind of got bored of the map, but with this particular map, because there's only one for right now anyway, right. but even though it's definitely smaller than the Fortnite map, but it's still, like, I feel like there's a lot of nuances that I haven't ever experienced or I've never, like, dropped in a certain place or I end up with the the circle still ends me up at somewhere that I've never been before or sure. the circle will close in a way that it has before in the same location. So it's kind right. of always a different... I mean, I'm sure there will be monotony at some point, but there's, like, a lot of different variations of how the game will go. So you bring up a good point, and I think one of the things that makes that true is the fact that it feels like all these multiplayer maps just kind of strung together like if you've ever played any other shooter first person shooter it kind of feels like there's multiple first person shooter maps strung together by little areas of like um terrain yeah that's a great great way to describe it because it's like places like the section of the map called market that could be almost an entire like first person shooter map right Um, so that's that's a great way to put it and i think the other piece of it too is that there's also this verticality that i haven't really experienced in a whole lot of shooters uh and so this is made by the people who've done titanfall which is another game that actually plays a lot with verticality because you can do things like wall run uh, and that type of thing so there's this verticality and what i mean by that is there's multiple levels to this right so you can drop down on something that's at a high level and then look down and there's like the same level of detail at the lower level as you um and you can look through almost it almost doubles the map in size in some places uh i'm thinking like the dam for example oh yeah right there's like multiple levels there which kind of add a layer of complexity that i don't 
I don't really find in other games. Maybe I just don't play enough shooters, but... Yeah, I don't think so. And, and I mean, the, also the being able to basically relaunch yourself on the map. Like, it's it's basically got these almost what looks like hot air balloons way up in the air off a zip line. Right. So you can almost reposition yourself. Uh, and that's something I haven't seen before. And it's pretty cool to have it from the guys that did Titanfall. And I'm assuming right. that more of those elements of it, like Titanfall feel will appear in the game as time goes on, too. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I've had a, I've had a blast playing with it. Uh, I think... I want to go home and play it with you after this is done. I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> just talking about it with you. Two just um, old nerds playing video games. Yeah. So if any of you uh, listeners want to jump in on it, let us know. Uh, hit us up on Slack. We're, we're happy to uh, to play. Uh, anyway, I think we've talked enough about... <laughs> Sorry, the image came up again. <laughs> oh, jeez. All right. Goes away. Well, <laughs> I think we've talked enough about video games. You know what? I, why don't we say we get into some Human Factors news? There we go. Yeah, Human Factors News. That's right. There's the there's the sounder. Uh, this is the part of the part of the show all about Human Factors News. We're done talking about video games. This is where we talk everything related to the field of Human Factors. Now, this could be anything from what do we got in there? We got like uh, some Big Brother things this this week. We got, got some stuff some, about facial recognition, the amount of guns that you can find in the airport, yeah, guns, VR, uh, in the, VR in the movie theater. And making your making the next generation of military weapons like an iPhone. Yeah, we got a lot of we got a lot of stuff in there. Okay, Blake, what do we have up first this week? All right, so there's a lot going on, but to kick us off, we got something from Amazon. So Amazon released a blog post it's last. It's Jeff Bezos' nudes. Oh yes, here we go. All right. <laughs> so in a blog post last week from Amazon, they posted some ethical guidelines around the use of facial facial recognition technology and called for national legislation on the topic. The company's own facial recognition software called Recogen, Recogen has been marred in the controversy since its public debut two years ago. The software can track people in photos or video and run those images against databases of millions of images in real time. The tool is currently used by at least one U.S. law enforcement agency to help identify criminals. Dozens of civil rights group, groups, Amazon employees, and several lawmakers have expressed concern that the tool could be used far more widespread or could be used to cover more government surveillance, but Congress has not yet introduced legislation on this topic. So Amazon's proposals include some suggestions that are already given, but also some stronger ones. So for instance, when law enforcement agencies find a suspected criminal match, they should have a real human being review the case before making an arrest. And another proposal called for law enforcement agencies to provide regular transparency reports to the public on how they're using the software and to notify the public with written signage when they're being surveilled with facial recognition technology. So this is kind of interesting to find out that two years in the making, this has been out and about in law enforcement. Because I really had no idea that Amazon, one, had a, had a piece of software called Reco- Recogen. 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 And I didn't I didn't really realize that they were one using in law enforcement, but that it would be Amazon that would have to be calling for the ethical guidelines. I would figure that would be something that legislation would already have been voted on for. Well, I mean, uh, I don't know. It, it's kind of not surprising to see how many sort of leading cutting edge technologies are not being addressed by Congress. Um, and I mean, like that's I mean, we talked to a friend of the show. Uh, Micah Inslee. That's true. Who's out there on the hill advocating for human factors. I mean, like, you know, so so they're definitely a little a little slow when it comes to uh, figuring out this technology, right? Like, you saw the Facebook hearings last year. They have no idea what's going on. Yeah, and I guess I should know better because I, listening to, like, Elon Musk talk about his trips to go talk to, you know, Congress and things like that about AI and then basically something similar happening to what happened with Facebook, just a lack of understanding of what the technology is and then the potential for it. Um, but this is from Amazon to basically calling out some of their own software is a really good like ethical call on their part, I think, especially when we're talking about people just in general not knowing that they're being surveil- surveilled in specific areas that they go into. I mean, like, this does not... Uh, I don't know. This this seems kind of like an afterthought to me, though, because, I mean, they, they did kind of come under fire uh, for this facial recognition technology, you know, probably three quarters of a year ago. Like, oh, my goodness. I really didn't realize it. Yeah, so, I mean, they, they kind of came under fire for this about ethics and everything, and it, it kind of is like, well, they should have had these uh, guidelines before they came out with the product, in my opinion. I don't know. Like, it, I don't know. It just seems a little... Uh, 
a little cart before the horse to me. But yeah, you know, I, I I think it's a good thing that they're thinking about it. Um, yeah, I think it's kind of a a strange thing that they would just release it and not really think about maybe the consequences of it. Uh, and it could and you could be right. I mean, it could be just the backlash in general that's causing for them to call to Congress to actually do something about this. Um, but the fact that, that that it's obviously been to, to some degree a successful product, but one line in here does kind of make me worried in terms of how it's been used in the past is them with Amazon's proposals, including something uh, along the lines of, so when law enforcement agencies find a suspected criminal match, they should have a real human being review the case before making an arrest. Yeah, that's, that's the part that's kind of concerning, that has there been a bunch of cases where they've just been trusting, <laughs> oh, the computer matched it, let's go this pick somebody clearly. up. Clearly the person, yeah. Uh, yeah, that is a little troubling, and I mean, I wonder how many other, like, that's just one example this article from uh, Recode uses is that specific example. I wonder how many more of those sort of corner cases are there that are not elevated, at least in this article. Yeah, it's kind of a rock and a hard place for me, though, to be completely honest, because it's talking about, and maybe I'm getting this wrong just because of the way it's phrased, but it's not saying, like, local state law enforcement. It's saying law enforcement agencies. So imagine this is being used by somebody like, somebody, some agency like the CIA or the NSA, potentially, you know, matching terrorists or something like that. And who who knows if that's really what it's being used for? Maybe it's been used just domestically. I'm not really sure. But it's you have to kind of think about it in your head. Like, well, if it's keeping keeping the country safer, is it worth some of the ethical issues that run into place, or should there be a lot more thought put into something like this? I think it's just an overarching question for the technology in general. We're talking about facial recognition combined with AI or anything like that. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I'd be curious to see where this goes next. Um, like Congress getting together and actually making some hard and fast laws on facial recognition technology. Because I mean, we've seen this with other applications. Like they just got together and started forming a loose set of guidelines for things like autonomous vehicles just last year. I think is I feel like is yeah. when we started talking about it. And so maybe the cart will be coming, so to speak. Uh, with with actual laws in place that protect people who, in a lot of cases, are going to get their faces scanned without consent. Yeah, uh, and that's a, that's a whole another issue, right? Is like consent to facial recognition scanning. Um, and I mean, it, I guess if it's for security, I, that makes a lot of sense to me, right? Airports, for example, um, but which we'll talk about later with security, right? Yeah, if you're if you're a known. Uh, you know, if, if you are a known criminal that has had offenses with guns, that might be one way to identify potential threats in airports. Like, I, I don't know. I'm thinking of actual tangible security reasons why you might want to use this without somebody's consent. But that's a whole nother conversation that needs to happen at the congressional level to make these laws. I'm unfamiliar with other countries. If they have laws in place already, might be a good place to start looking. Yeah, because I know that we did one story about the UK talking about like really, really high level AI guidelines last year. Uh, so that, that might be something worth thinking about, but it, it is definitely a problem that I think we're going to face in Congress. And I think it's a similar thing to what you brought up about Facebook. I think that there's just going to have to be a big play of like people that are into technology that are in the space, people that are into human factors, like being a part of the committees that actually help make these legislative, these legislations, because if, if not, you end up with things that may be kind of misinformed or just not very well formed ethically to kind of guide where this technology goes. But interesting article, and I'm stoked to see kind of where it goes from here. Yeah, for sure. All right, what do we got up next? All right, so once upon a time, the company with the biggest screens in the world made a big bet on virtual reality. IMAX opened seven VR centers and movie theaters around the globe, each of which hosted rotating selections of games, social exper experiences, and short narrative pieces. It set up a $50 million fund to develop content for these centers, and it partnered even with Google to build next-generation cameras that would allow filmmakers to realize their next-generation VR dreams. Then it all kind of just disappeared. The camera project was canceled, and this past December, IMAX let shareholders know that the rest of it, the remaining centers and certain VR content investments, would be winding down as well. But while IMAX was closing its centers, other big theater chains are tiptoeing into the space using a different playbook. 
better VR for your locations and taking it nice and slow. It's all part of adapting to an entertainment landscape that's not as friendly as it used to be. So Simmark and other exhibitors are facing a lot of competition, not just from each other and other out-of-home entertainment venues, but streaming as well, says Mark Alexis Macklin, an analyst at Greeting Greenlight Insights, a marketing intelligence firm focused on virtual and augmented reality experiences. So movie theaters are really focused on bringing in premium experiences that you can't do at home. VR is definitely the first step for a lot of that. So don't wait for VR quite yet. The coming attractions are still pretty promising. This is something I've actually wondered a lot about is why we don't see more VR experiences in movie theaters. And I guess it comes down to maybe camera access, being able to, like how many people really want to go to a movie theater and put on a VR headset? It depends. So, yeah, I almost said it. It does depend. So, look, like, here's the thing. They mentioned it here in this article. You want to go for a VR experience that you can't have anywhere else. Uh, A few last year, I guess right around this time, I went to The Void, which is the Secrets of the Empire. Um, They did this in, uh, well, we did this in Anaheim at Disneyland. And basically, the thing that makes this different is that you are actually in a shared space with other people. Um, and that's a little bit hard to do in a traditional home setting, right? You, Definitely, You're yeah. with other people in this environment. Um, you can go to potentially the franchises that you love. It was a Star Wars thing for me, right? So, you know, we get all suited up. We're actually stormtroopers, and anything that we actually touch in the physical environment was mapped to the virtual environment. So we're touching panels. We're opening doors. We're walking through these things. We feel the heat. We smell the smoke. Um so it's like a, a totally sensory experience. It was it was a lava planet. Yeah, it was, and, and you know we feel the shots when we get shot in our armor. Like, it was it was the full everything. Um, so yes, it was very much an experience that we couldn't have at home, um, and you know especially for someone like my partner who is gets motion sick very easy. Um, in cases like this, you can actually map it to the physical environment so you feel like you're actually moving through like through the real world uh and i think the more senses there kind of really helped her with not being so motion sick during this because she's actually moving she's not like moving a controller and then having that move forward it's like a true feel of immersion instead of just like feeling like you're kind of passively there in vr right and i mean like if you think about motion sickness you have the the way the reason why you get motion sickness is because the movement in your ears does not match what's happening to your eyes yeah and so that's why and so if it if it is matched then mapped uh appropriately then yeah i mean i think it's it's a lot better so i think that's ultimately the reason why you want to go to these things as opposed to staying at home is because they can give you something that home can't. You can't get the heat of lava. I guess you could put like a heater in front of you. It's not the same. You can't smell smoke. Set something on fire in front of you. See how well that goes. Like, and, and to have it happen at just the right times, right? Like that's that coordination piece is a little bit more difficult. These are full blown sensory experiences that, um, they're hoping to accomplish in these things. I know of a few, at least. I know there's the Star Wars one. I know there's a Wreck-It Ralph one. I know there's a Terminator one. So basically putting all these together in one space, uh, and they might reuse the same space, right, for different experiences, but it's a completely different experience, right? Like if you think about the Wreck-It Ralph, you might not experience heat. You might experience coolness. Like you might get a fan in front of you or you might smell candy or something rather than smoke. So there are ways in which you can alter the experience using the same layout um, that still kind of, you you reuse the components. I don't know. It's There's a lot to think about here, and uh, I've often kind of fantasized about, my dream job would be to put together one of these experiences um, because there's so many elements that kind of come together. It's, it's a really cool thing. Anyway, I blabbed and blabbed and blabbed. I'm curious what your thoughts are, though. Well, it now makes a little bit more sense why maybe it doesn't work so well just for the movie space because it's that is something you could potentially just do passively at home if you already have any of the gear or if you're interested sure. in seeing a film in VR. But like something that allows you to interact with other people in a virtual environment that's so immersive, like the Star Wars one or the Wreck-It Ralph one that you were talking about, that's probably more appealing. 
or more drives more people to come and see it or experience it because it's it's right. like something you could do with a bunch of friends you're not just really doing it with other people you don't necessarily know but at the same time that's even like a enticing as well i mean think about think about it this way too like let's say the the next star wars movie comes out uh in december and you go to a cinemark and they say hey do you want to buy the bundle you can watch the movie right after the movie. You can go through the Star Wars thing. And let's say they make a special Star Wars thing that focuses on like the climax of the movie. So that way you literally just watch the movie and now you're living it in a virtual environment. So that makes sense to me in like a cinema setting because then you could just go from one to the other. And I feel like that will have some lasting impact about how you feel about that movie going on. Right. Like, let's say let's say the folks that did not find The Last Jedi very uh, entertaining or they just have a problem with it right there there's a lot of them out there um let's say they go did the last jedi but then after that they got to relive the battle of crate they were in the trenches shooting at the at uh, mt oh man i'm gonna get reamed uh <laughs> it's they're they're shooting at the walkers they're shooting at you know the first orders they're on the sand dunes of crate not dunes the sand flats of, of crate and they're like in the trenches and and they you can smell retreat. the salt they smell the salt. They, they, yeah, the whole sensory experience. They might have liked the movie more because they actually got to do that afterwards. Like, there's a lot of kind of combinations that I can see really working for this. You watch the new Terminator movie, and then you go run away from Terminator. Uh, you know, like yeah, you are John Connor for a moment. Yeah, there are things that you can do as tie-ins to movies. So I I see this as like the perfect tie-in, and it's just a matter of getting um, buy-in from some of the corporations that uh, they can make a lot of money in this space, right? With Sure, yeah. Like, let's say, a similar layout. Like, if you literally reuse the layout, maybe maybe have, like, two or three different layouts that you can sort of make um, different experiences on, right? And you provide that feedback, but then you design it around that environment. I don't know. There's, there's a lot of cool things that you can do. Oh, yeah, and I, I think that employ, I mean, that adds kind of jobs to your your tier set because you're gonna have to have people to always come and redo basically your vr experience based on what's coming in right i mean you could potentially get more money for like when you shoot films because you're planning for something like this yeah yeah so there's just a lot of cool avenues that and i think it's because we've talked about vr over the past god how long have we been doing this podcast like two years two and a half two and a half years we talked a lot Almost about three like trying to get its application outside of video games and entertainment. Yeah. But I think a lot of where it's going to grab a lot of traction can be in entertainment. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. Like don't write entertainment and video games out. Like that'll be a huge application of it. I yeah. just think, you know, when we talk about it on the show, we try not to focus on that, but we look outside of that domain. Cause that's an obvious fit, right? Like everyone can have a VR device in their home and do those things. I think, we try on this show to look outward. And this is kind of fun to look at, like, yes, this is a no-duh uh, kind of application, but it's cool to see companies actually taking it and running with it and yeah. planning for it. And I, I want to see the movie theater industry continue and not disappear as well. Like, I know they're having to compete a lot, but I still love going to movies, and if, like, getting into... You know, more VR experience is a way to go. I think it's a perfect segue into just bringing people out of their homes and into the into more movies and then into different experiences like this. You know what we should do? Next time The Void comes into town, we should, The Secrets of the Empire, we should go do that. Yeah, I've never done it. It'd be awesome. Oh, I'd love to do that with you. All right. Well, uh, we will be back to break down the rest of the news stories right after this. Factors Cast strives to bring you the best in human factors chatter every week. We pack news, interviews, reviews, and overall fun conversations into each and every product that we put our seal of approval on. But we can't do it without you. You see, the Human Factors Cast Network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running this show come from the listeners. That's why we're giving back to our supporters on Patreon now more than ever. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like 24-7 access to our exclusive Human Factors Cast Slack channel, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Cast Infinite, a Patreon-only podcast where the topic is human factors, etc. We're always updating our rewards, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you all, and remember, it depends. Just 
piggybacking off of the Patreon. I want to remind everybody that right now is a great time to jump in. We just did our preview of what we are now doing an eight movie series for uh, the American Space Program in which we will provide commentary on these movies and documentaries. Um, So we'll play the audio. We'll talk over it as it pertains to human factors, right? Some of these movies may or may not touch human factors. A lot of them definitely do. It is the American Space Program. Why would it not? Uh, So just to kind of give you all a preview of the eight movies that we have identified this spans so many different like time frames just when the movies were put out so yeah. it's gonna be so fun yeah it's gonna it's gonna be a great time hopefully you can join us if not you should definitely join us uh so we got the right stuff followed by uh hidden figures this is chronological order then we're gonna be doing mercury 13 which is a documentary um about the the women who were tested for space flight but didn't actually get to go into space then we got first man um uh, with uh, Neil Ar- Armstrong, yes, yeah, he's, with, he's uh, Ryan amazing. Gosling as Neil Armstrong. Uh, that's that's a shout out for somebody. Uh, and then we have Mission Control: The Unsung Heroes of Apollo, which is a documentary uh, taking a look at the Apollo space program. Then we're gonna do Apollo 13, of course. Can't yeah. get away without a Tom Hanks special. Yeah, got to throw some Ron Howard in there. Uh, then we're gonna do Last Man on the Moon, which is also a documentary. Um, and then we're going to top the whole thing off with a uh, challenger disaster, which is a, uh, I think it's a documentary. I don't know. It's a science channel doc. So yeah, we, we have a lot, a nice mix of drama and some actual documentary stuff. So we'll have a I'm lot sure. to talk about throughout yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It'll be the, the documentaries are always so heavy. I feel. And, and the, uh, the dramas will be there to kind of, there's a nice mix of emotions versus like a yeah. very darker tone. Because a lot of the stuff, this is like serious things that went wrong in the beginning of going into space in a lot of ways. So it'll be a cool, cool segment. Yeah, so join us on Patreon. Anyway, uh, moving on, I just want to thank all of our friends over at Vox, Wired, and Gizmodo for all of our stories this week. If you guys want to follow along, you can follow us all over social media or join our Slack for links to the original articles. Been a little bit bad about that lately, but it's okay. We're still posting them. So still posting, we, still doing shows. Yeah, it's good. yeah, we're still we're still there. Uh, even though we may not post them during the week, we definitely post them. So be sure to check there. All right, Blake, we got two more stories this week. What do we got? All right. So first up, officials at the Armament Research Development and Engineering Center told military and veterans news site Task and Purpose this week that the goal of the Next Generation Squad Weapons Project is to replace its increasingly haggard M4 rifle and M249 squad automatic weapon with a new generation of 6.8 millimeter rifles to create an iOS like platform for shooting people. Really? That's not, that is verbatim from the website. So imagine that Steve jobs and his engineers were trying to convert the iPad touch, the first three G iPhone project manager for soldier weapons said that there are a thousand technologies they could have put into the first iPhone, but they were looking to mature the platform before they actually got go onto the system. The team hopes that the new rifle will include a specially designed fire control system that's engineered to boost hit probability at extended ranges, an onboard processor hardened against cyber attacks, and something called the Advanced Small Arms Ballistic System that works like a miniaturized artillery positioning and fire finding system. And last but not least, a multi-laser range finding system to detect things like wind speed and help soldiers adjust their aim. So when we first pulled up the story, Nick, I couldn't imagine how this was going to be like an iPhone. But this thing literally sounds like it's going to be the Swiss army knife of guns to help the warfighter do their job with a little more tech inside of it. Siri, reload. Uh, That's terrifying. (laughs) I mean... (sighs) Okay. Uh, So, look, you and I work with military. I have never worked with warfighters before. Uh, have you? I have not. Okay. So we can at least talk about this a little bit open. Um, I've mentioned it on the show before. This is a little tricky for me because the closer we get to the trigger, design-wise, the more uncomfortable I feel. Um, I try to stay far away from that stuff on any project that I work on. This is um, crazy. Uh, I, 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 like... There's so much tech packed into this thing. And I don't want to say, like, it's not necessary. It absolutely is. It's just, like, 
I, I'm weird about guns, man. Like, I, I don't know. Like, any any device that can take another person's life, and when you are... Uh, maybe this is just an ethics issue. I don't know, man. I, I feel really uncomfortable about it. But the w- whenever you're, like, loading up this device to more efficiently take human lives, it seems like... Uh, I don't know. I I'm I don't know. I don't like it. <laughs> yeah. And so I'll I will very timidly play devil's advocate a little bit here. Okay. <laughs> so uh, and please do not misunderstand me. I have the same ethical issues that you do when it comes to like the closer you get to hurting somebody, the farther I want to be away from it. Large butt here. I also am I've had a lot of very close friends over the past you know, I don't know, five, six years that have been from the military and have, you know, dedicated their part of their lives to defending our country and what it stands for and were first in hand to use some of these technologies. Yeah. And there was definitely a period where they were so bad that it cost people lives. And if they're... And so okay. the other yeah. side of this coin is like, okay, yes, we're making... We're taking, like, iPhone-like technologies and putting it into a rifle, which ultimately makes it a more efficient killing machine. But at the same time, the person on the end of that machine is now likely going to, you know, be able to save their own life. Or it could potentially, you know, do something something like not mess up as many times in in combat and cause accidents that kill other people in your platoon. Like, if you're improving accuracy, you could take the life of the target rather than a civilian that was off to the side. I understand. I understand. Yeah, or you could stop incidents that happen where your own gun goes off and you hurt somebody on your own team. Yeah. That kind of stuff. There's a lot of, I think, interesting ethical questions that come with weapon design. Sure. uh, Especially like this, where you are making it super, a lot easier probably for somebody to pick up and figure out how to use effectively. Yeah, and I mean, there's also other applications, right? Like, let's say your whole squad is wearing... Um, a tag in which if the barrel of the gun is pointed towards one of those tags, it won't fire because friendly fire, right? Like, yeah. So I, I understand there's a lot of issue with, with great power comes great responsibility, right? I mean, really, this is... It's the, the most true in this story. Absolutely. Sure. Like, this is... Um, I don't know. I just get a little uncomfortable talking about it. I understand there's plenty of applications, and I understand that it can save lives. Uh, but it's also taking them, and so there's like this weird yeah, dichotomy a, inside. It's me. a very fine balance between where you sit on either side of that argument, right? Uh, yeah. But the the thing I actually find most interesting about this is not the like some of the more like that it's it's supposed to like boost probability of hitting things at extended ranges or adding in some more range finding stuff. It's the fact that what's called out specifically is an onboard processor hardened against cy- cyber attacks. So that at least is telling me that somebody's really thinking or having to already worry about potential stuff that's out there that could be hacking weapons like this or has hacked weapons that have more tech inside of them now. Yeah. Can you imagine if, like, you know, there's an... uh, Just imagine for a minute here. You bring up the cybersecurity threat. That's a real threat. Um, So that's good that they're thinking about it. However, think about in this case, right? those friendly fire tags that I just mentioned. What if, you know, someone hacks this device to say auto shoot on friendly fire tags because they're actually hostile. Like that is, Oh my God. We're dealing with a lot of carnage from just a cyber attack. They're nowhere near this and they're, they're doing damage, which I think is a really great, point and a good place to really think about inserting like people that are in inhuman factors into the equation of what should really be allowed to be automated versus what is just not a good candidate for that and i think now in 2019 especially you have to weigh in for anything that's adding tech to weapon systems or just technology in general that's collecting our data using it for you know, different algorithms and like targeting you with ads, you have to really question like what can be, what can make me vulnerable from a data or an automation perspective that is related to like AI or cyber attacks. And I think that's something we often don't think of enough until after it's already happened. 
and hopefully over the next like five, ten years, because cybersecurity is get to, getting to be much more of a buzzword at the moment, that we'll start to see that part play part of the equation of how do we design technology and how do we design products. The thing that would, I think, irritate me the most about this is that there's going to be one button on it if they're truly designing it like iPhones. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that was a joke. The Steve Jobs <laughs> of guns, yeah. Jeez. I mean... A singular button. I mean, I... I I would hope there's more than one button, one for safety, one for... I'm sure there's plenty of buttons. Yeah. But anyway, I I don't know. This is a sensitive topic for me to talk about, so I don't know how much more conversation I can have about this other than this feels icky, but also at the same time, I understand the need for it. And we just got to... It's... it's We just got to think about it from different perspectives now, right? Like before, the threat was if somebody picked up your gun and used it against you. And now it's... What if somebody picked up that gun and used it against you while you're, it's in your hands? Uh, yeah. And so, like, that's a very real threat. Let's think about cybersecurity. Uh, if you're out there thinking about this stuff, good on you. Yeah, props to you. Uh, it's just something that I couldn't personally ever work on, which is why I haven't worked with warfighters. Uh, okay, so we have one more news story. Um, also, coincidentally, about guns. I don't, we didn't even plan that. We That's didn't the plan this. Ironic part. Yeah. Two gun right. stories at the end. So, America broke a new record last year, but it's not the kind you want to write home about. Ooh. The Transportation <laughs> Security Administration, aka the TSA, found 4,239 firearms in carry on luggage in 2018, breaking the previous record that was set in 2017. That was an average of more than 11 guns per day found in carry on luggage. So the number of guns found by the TSA in 2018 was up roughly 7% from 2017. But probably the most disturbing statistic was that 86% of these guns that were discovered by TSA were actually loaded. And to make matters worse, around 34% actually had a bullet in the chamber. So the top five airports where TSA officers detected guns at checkpoints in 2018 was in Hartsfield, Jackson, Atlanta International, Dallas Fort Worth International Orlando International airports and Americans so this is an interesting fact Nick and I talked a little bit about in the article and it's actually that Americans are able to legally fly with firearms but they must be unloaded and locked away in checked luggage so to be clear what was happening here over the past years people were finding these in carry on luggage so even replica guns and replica guns and toy guns are required by federal law to be in checked luggage as well so that that just taught me a lot that I didn't really know about kind of American gun policies because I just thought you couldn't take a gun on a plane at all. I didn't really realize that it might be the case that you couldn't actually pack it away. Um, but that's a pretty steep rise over the past, you know, from I think it's the story talks about all the way from 2008 to 2018. So we're seeing like a decade rise of nearly like 3,000 and some chain guns over time. Yeah, that's a... Okay, first off, that's a lot of guns. And that's a lot more guns than in 2008. That's four times as many guns. It's a lot of guns. Uh, Yeah, I also learned that you can travel with a carry-on here. And, you know, you and I were talking before the show about how um, certain states that we visited and lived in have these open carry laws and how it kind of makes us feel a little uncomfortable, at least me. Um, it was shocking and, and more more than I was uncomfortable. It's just like, what, is there something going on here that I wasn't aware of? This is when I moved to a particular state and had never yeah. lived there before. I mean, dude, like even, I don't know, dude, just guns just make me feel uncomfortable. Make you feel around. icky. Yeah. Like, well, I, like think about this. Like we visit military bases and usually at the front of the base you have an armed guard. And even though you know they're on your side, like that's still an, a loaded weapon. In guns are hands. scary. Yeah. Like. Anybody, in anybody's you know, hands, they're, they're scary. One oopsie and like, whoops, like it's, it's, it's scary. So, I mean, I understand the point. Like I understand the point of them. It just, it, it's a little scary to me. Well, even like being around trained professionals with them, there's something that just makes me, I, I don't know. It, again, this goes back to the, it's going to, I'm going to sound like I'm countering my point that I made last story right but it, it does make me <laughs> uncomfortable to be around guns one because i'm not like a trained professional that knows how to handle myself with a gun either so that's one part but it's just in general the the concept of guns is just it's terrifying i don't want anybody's life taken anywhere near me you know what the worst part about this is is the fact that this news story has been a news story for the last eight years every year they have confiscated a new record 
of guns. And in fact, when I'm trying to source a video on YouTube right now, it is six years ago, five years ago, four years ago, three years ago, two years ago. a bunch of them, yeah. Again and again and again. And it's like, okay, I, I get it. I get it. Americans love our guns. Fine. But why do we need to take them on planes to other states? And like, I just... Anyway, I'm not a gun guy. Uh, I'm curious, though, if you are a gun guy, like, write to me on Slack. Like, I'm happy to have this conversation. I'm not against owning a gun. I think I think that's an American right. I just am. I, I don't. I'm very much like, why do we why do we need like bum stocks? Right. Like, that? why do we need automatic rifles like those types of things? I don't there's not a need for them. Uh, and this is getting political. Who cares? I don't. I don't care anymore. Uh, like, I just. Yeah, I'm at a loss for words right now. I just, why yeah. do we have so many guns? And why are we taking them on planes? But that why? was the interesting part. Is like how because <laughs> these aren't guns being confiscated if you follow the rules. This is if like you accidentally brought it and you like, oops, I didn't put it in my check luggage. I left it in my carry on luggage. Which maybe if you, especially if any of these states, because I'm not sure about every one of the states that I listed in terms of airports, but if all of these states are carry states, then potentially maybe it's just, it's an everyday occurrence for you and you just, you know, forget over time. Like, oh, I can't really take this with me now, although I'm used to carrying it all the time. So I can yeah. see that being an error. Uh, the decade rise, the it's, it's pretty steep, I'll admit that. But the one thing I don't know is how many more guns have been produced in a decade. I mean, is it more than usual? Is it less? I really don't know. I don't know how many more guns are out there than normal. And the, the one thing that's not in here either is all are all of these registered guns versus guns that have just gotten into the hands of people that aren't necessarily registered, if they're just like a gun count. So I think there's a few variables that are kind of interesting in there. Um but I think overall, too, it, it begs the question that I have is, like, over 10 years, so from 2008 to 2018, has detection just gotten better over time okay. with machines, All right, people that you've, point. that you've got in, like, the people you're training, the amount, the amount of staff that you have, right? Because what is that? 2011 is 911, right? So, three, but like, the three years before were close to 1,000, and then after that, it starts to kind of climb. 2011 was 10 years after 9/11. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, because yeah. it's 2001. 2001. Yeah, I don't. You're off numbers, by a decade. It's okay. It's okay. It's everything blurs together. Well, then I would actually expect it to be more than that. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Huh. So it's it's not even as much as maybe the expectation I would have. Yeah, I don't know this. So thinking about the human factors of this, right? Like, why did we pull this story? Well, okay, I I alluded to this earlier, right? With safety, security, facial recognition, I think. You're right in that technology is getting better and better and better at detecting these things. And this also comes back to that moral ethical question that we had about facial technology and other technology without people's consent. Like, does it make sense to have that in an environment where, you know, there are potentially 11 guns at any given point around the world in airports? Like, Think about that. On a daily basis, you can count on roughly 11 guns that are not being pulled, you know, uh, brought onto the airplane in the way that they're supposed to. Think about that. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a lot of guns. Yeah. Because, I, mean, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, of the amount of people that go through any of one of these airports per day, 11 is not very many. But when we're talking about weapons, that's a kind of a different story. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. It, 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 it's a lot. And... Uh, I'm looking at how many America airports there are. Uh, it looks like 13,000. Okay. So, <laughs> all right. So that doesn't really add up, but I, I, I'm just thinking about like chances and probability of you running into one of these things. Probably still really low. It, in the grand scheme, it is really low. I mean, one thing that I will say about this article is it's, it's, it's a bit skewed towards making the numbers seem bigger than they are. Because we're talking about how many airports across the United States, how many travelers per day, how yeah. many like, and then yes. let's let's just go with the airport that had the highest over a year. It was two two hundred ninety eight at Hartsfield Jackson Atlanta International. So I mean that's a lot, but over how much time? So three hundred sixty five days. That's almost one a day. day. That's almost oh, one that's a day terrifying. though. Like if you think about yeah, that's the that's the thing. It's like if you're going to that airport, you can almost 
almost guarantee that there's going to be one there that day. Yeah, almost. <sighs> it's. Uh, but yeah. again, I think it, it has a lot to say about how technologies come over the past 10 years and the stringent processes that are now in place to kind of catch some of these things. Yeah, I agree. All right, we got to move it along because we've actually been burning through some of these. So it's time for... It came from... It came from... That's right. It came from Reddit. It did. It did. This is the part of the show where we search all over Reddit to bring you guys topics the community's talking about. Any topic is fair game. Any subreddit is fair game. As long as it relates to the topic of human factors and encourages discussion among the community. That's the important part. Uh, this one's going to be fun because this one kind of links into what we talked about with the Cinemark and VR, AR stuff in the movie theaters. That's very true. All right. So this one's called uh, ARMR, that's Augmented Reality, Mixed Reality, Design Documentation Examples. Uh, this is by Klimbat3 on the User Experience subreddit. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, so hello, lovely UX and human factors community. I added there a little bit. You did. Uh, Ad libbing. Do, does anyone have examples of design documentation for developer handoff of mixed reality and augmented reality projects? Especially examples that account for gestures and voice. I'm trying to improve my process and can't find much online yet. Cheers. Okay. I'm going to take this one first, if you don't mind. Oh, please do, because okay. you know more about it than I do, for All sure. All right. So let me, let me preface this with VR is my hobby. I don't work with any VR directly. I've worked with VR in the past. However, I've never worked with like a developer that I haven't worked super closely with to like hand it over the fence. So I haven't really put together any design documentation. However, I have put together design documentation for other products and I can take some of that and kind of abstract it for the AR, MR, VR space. Because there's a lot of transferability, I'm sure, about those. There is. So first and foremost, you're going to want to provide some sort of way to show what the person is doing um, in order to, you know, kind of establish their workflow, right? If you have a mixed reality or augmented reality system in which you are trying to accomplish a very specific thing. Like let's take, for example, Google maps, right? Let's just take that. For example, that's a VR application. Uh, you are on Google maps for a very specific reason. You're there to understand the geography of an area. You're on there to get directions. You're on there to just look at, I already said geography of an area, but those are really the two main use cases, right? So first establish your use cases. Then, establish how you're going to interact with each of those use cases and you're looking for specific examples about like gestures and voice so here's what i would do for google i would or for google maps let's say to do a certain interaction like a zoom for example i would illustrate first a person standing with the controllers in their hands together and then the next panel, almost like a comic book. It's like sketch, sketching and uh, storyboarding is really important for this, especially to convey it. If you're good in other programs, like let's say Unity, you could almost put together like a 3D model to show what the user is doing while they have something on their head and create like an animated gift to show somebody like, hey, as I move my hands apart, draw the motion and then show in the second frame, your hands apart, um, show what's on the screen, right? So in frame one, hands together, Zoom level, 100%. Yeah. Uh, as you pull them apart and zoom in, uh, zoom level, what, like 120 or something, right? And that's that's what you show in that kind of storyboarding scenario. Gotcha. So it's it's almost like visually interactive interaction notes. Yes. That's, that's kind of what I'm thinking in my head. Of course, it might not be that simple, right? Like you could draw a user with a little comic bubble that says... Uh, so and so for a, for a uh, voice interaction, and then in the next panel, show what that would result in, um, both on the interface and what it looks like for the user. Right? There's two views that you're looking at. Whereas in some interaction notes or interactive prototypes, you can just show one thing and not the other. Yeah, and I guess in this case, the interactive prototype piece is a little more difficult, right? Because you you've kind of almost got mm -hmm. yourself partially there if you can communicate there's voice things happening and there's gesture based things happening too right but you can so here's where paper prototyping might come in and i'm using a very simplistic example please understand that google maps is very simplistic 
in these terms. I get it. I'm just trying to come up with some documentation examples. Yeah. So like if you're thinking about paper prototyping, you could do that. You could say like, okay, here you give them like two rulers or something. Here are your controls. Show me how you would zoom in. And they would, you'd give them one paper, one piece of paper in front of their face that would give you a certain zoom level. You move them apart. Second piece of paper with a, with a higher zoom level effectively, or even just, you know, uh, have, have it in front of them. And as they move their hands apart, move it forward. And that's basically what's happening. So there are ways to convey these types of things, understanding that a lot of these interactions can get very complex. Um, but if you build the building blocks in this document, then the interaction can kind of be inferred between the steps. Anyway, that's my two cents. Curious what you think. <laughs> yeah, so the biggest thing, and this this kind of sucks and kind of doesn't. It, it all depends on what you're working on and how the company is if you deal with open source software or anything. But I think the biggest thing that you can do, what is it, Climbat 3, is whatever you come up with, if you're able to actually share that documentation out into like the quote-unquote UX community or UX world related to AR and MR design documentation... I think that'll be super helpful because I bet you there's a lot of people asking themselves the same question. I think I would probably tackle it, of course, like echoing some of Nick's sentiments, like know what your developer is working in. If it's something like Unity, there may be stuff that exists that you can leverage to talk about and say like, hey, I've seen X module that does this kind of gesture. We want to use that for right. zooming. Um, another thing to look up, and this is this is kind, these are kind of useful, and I think there's a lot of room for improvement. But there's definitely gesture style guides that exist, and I know it's a lot lower level for some of the like iPhone or Android type gesture interactions. But that might be a good place to start because I know that at least for material design, they started developing some more, you know, to show you a little bit more interaction, like a swipe to the right a swipe down like what can you do to mirror those kind of things that already exist um but basically i think nick's point of hammering out what the use cases are and using those as your baseline to walk a developer through whether it's through paper whether it's through you know more stylized documentation whatever it is just hammer on the use case of why you're using a specific gesture and understanding the constraints of whatever system they're working in before getting to that point yeah, I like it. It's good. I like it a lot. All right, let's get out Share. of here, Blake. Let's get out of here. That's it for today, everyone. Let us know what you guys think of the stories this week. If you're a Patreon supporter, no after show today, we are going to start our eight-part... Actually, it's more than that. It's like 16-part commentary on 1, the American... 1,000 parts of American yeah. Space Program. Anyway, we'll probably just keep adding to it on and on and on. We're going to start that next week. For the rest of you, you can join the discussion on our Slack or follow us on all of our social media channels at H Factors Podcast. If you like what you hear and want to support the show, you can review you can review us on your podcast medium of choice. And if you do that, might as well just enter that contest anyway, because you get five entries just for doing that. Uh, you know, or you can consider supporting us on Patreon. That's an option too. Uh, and of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. To enter the contest, the links in the show notes and on Slack. Please go do that. Really easy, nice, uh, easy way for you to win a trip to the healthcare symposium lovely in, chicago uh, in chicago this year i want to thank mr blake arnstorff for hanging out with me where can our listeners go and find you if they want to talk about vr and guns if you want to talk about vr and guns you can always hit me up on twitter at don't panic ux special thanks to jeff olson for our video editing each and every week as for me i've been your host nick rome you can find me across social media at nick underscore rome thanks again for tuning in to human factors cast and until next time it, it depends, depends. how much I don't like guns, but I want to go home and play a shooter with you. I know, it's ridiculous.